on the 5th of December 1915. Representatives of the Allied powers gathered at the French headquarters in Chantilly to discuss plans for the coming year. The meeting came to the conclusion that the minor fronts that had been opened in places such as Salonika and the Middle East would not be reinforced and that the focus would be on mounting coordinating offensives against Germany and Austria-Hungary in Europe. The goal of these offensives was to prevent the Central Powers from shifting troops to defeat each offensive in turn. In other words, they wanted to force the Central Powers to commit as many soldiers to a certain front to stop them from committing soldiers to other theatres and fronts of the war. This was part of a strategy known as War of Attrition, which entailed a prolonged period of conflict during which each side seeks to gradually wear down the other by a series of offensives. On the Western Front, General Joseph Joffre and the new commander of the British Expeditionary Force, General Sir Douglas Haig, debated strategy. While Joffre initially favoured several smaller assaults, Haig desired to launch a major offensive in Flanders, Belgium. After much discussion, the two decided on a combined offensive along the Somme River, with the British on the north bank and the French on the south. Though both armies had suffered major casualties in 1915, they had succeeded in raising large numbers of new troops, which allowed the offensive to move forward. Most notable of these were the 24 new army divisions formed under the guidance of British War Secretary Lord Kitchener. Also known as Kitchener's Army or Kitchener's Mob, the new army was initially an all-volunteer army of the British Army. It originated on the recommendation of Kitchener to raise 500,000 volunteers. Kitchener's original intention was that it would be formed and ready to be put into action by mid-1916, but circumstances dictated its use before then. Comprised of volunteers, the new army units were raised under the promise of those who joined together would serve together. As a result, many of the units were comprised of soldiers from the same towns or localities, leading to them being referred to as chums or pals battalions. Due to the huge numbers of men wishing to sign up, in some places queues were more than a kilometer formed outside recruitment offices, there were many problems in equipping and providing shelter for the new recruits. Rapidly, the government added many new recruitment centers, which eased the admissions burden and began a program of temporary construction at the main training camps. Almost 2.5 million men volunteered for Kitchener's army between 1914 and 1916. By the beginning of 1916, the queues were not as long. Information about the true brutality of the war had reached Britain and patriotic and militaristic enthusiasm had plummeted. Thus, the British government had to resort to conscription under the Military Service Act of 1916. Interestingly, conscription not only forced men to join the military, but also forced certain men not to join. Skilled workers and craftsmen who had volunteered early in the war could be drafted back into the munitions industry where they were sorely needed. Meanwhile, the Central Powers were planning an offensive strategy of their own in an attempt to win a decisive victory that would end the war. While Austrian Chief of Staff Count Konrad von Hotzendorf made plans for attacking Italy through the Trentino Offensive on the border between Austria and Italy, his German counterpart, Erich von Falkenhayn, was looking to the Western Front. Falkenhayn incorrectly believed that the Russians had been effectively defeated the year before after the Gorlis-Tarno Offensive so he decided to concentrate Germany's offensive power on knocking France out of the war, knowing full well that with France out of the war, Britain would be forced to negotiate for peace. To do so, he sought to attack the French at a vital point along the front. He planned to attack the French there where they would not be able to retreat due to issues of strategy and national pride. As a result, he intended to compel the French to commit to a battle that would bleed France white. Falkenhayn selected Verdun as the target of his operation. Verdun was relatively isolated in the salient that pushed out into the German lines. 
the French could only reach the city over one road while it was located near several German railheads. Dubbing the plan Operation Gericht, or Judgment, Falkenhayn secured Kaiser Wilhelm II's approval and began massing his troops. A fortress town on the Meuse River, Verdun protected the plains of Champagne and the approaches to the French capital Paris. Surrounded by rings of forts and batteries, Verdun's defences had been weakened in 1915 as artillery was shifted to other sections of the line. Falkenhayn intended to launch his offensive on the 12th of February, but it was postponed for nine days due to poor weather. Alerted to the attack, the delay allowed the French to reinforce the city's defences. Surging forward on the 21st of February, the Germans succeeded in driving the French back. Feeding reinforcements into the battle, including French General Philippe Batain's 2nd Army, the French began to inflict heavy losses on the Germans as the attackers lost the protection of the artillery. In March, the Germans changed tactics and assaulted the flanks of Verdun at the Mort Horn and caught Hill 304. Fighting continued to rage through April and May of 1916, with Germans slowly advancing, but at a massive cost. The Kaiserliche Marine, or German Navy, began planning efforts to break the British blockade of the North Sea in May 1916. Outnumbered in battleships and battle cruisers, the German commander of the High Seas Fleet, Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer, hoped to lure part of the British fleet into an ambush with the goal of evening the numbers for a larger engagement at a later date. To accomplish this, Scheer intended to have Vice Admiral Franz Hipper's scouting force of battle cruisers raid the English coast to draw out British Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty's battle cruiser fleet. Hipper would then withdraw, luring Beatty towards the High Seas fleet, which would destroy the British ships. Putting this plan into action, Scheer was unaware that British codebreakers had notified his opposite number, Admiral Sir John Jellicoe, that a major operation was happening. As a result, Jellicoe sorted with his Grand Fleet to support BT. Around 2.30pm on the 31st of May 1916, BT clashed with Hipper and lost two battle cruisers. Alerted to the approach of Scheer's battleships, BT reversed course towards Jellicoe. The resulting fight proved the only major clash between the two nations' battleship fleets. Jellicoe compelled the Germans to eventually withdraw by matching their attack. The battle concluded with confused night actions as the smaller warships met each other in the dark and the British attempted to pursue Scheer. While the Germans succeeded in sinking more tonnage and inflicting higher casualties, the battle itself resulted in a strategic victory for the British. Though the British public had sought a decisive naval triumph, the German efforts at Jutland failed to break the British blockade or significantly reduce the Royal Navy's numerical advantage in capital ships. Also, the result led to the German high seas fleet effectively remaining in port for the remainder of the war as the Kaiserliche Marine turned its focus to submarine warfare. Back on the Western Front, as a result of the fighting at Verdun, the Allied plans for an offensive along the Somme were modified to make it a largely British operation. Moving forward with the goal of easing pressure on Verdun, the main push was to come from General Sir Henry Rawlinson's 4th Army, which was largely comprised of territorial and new army troops. Donald Murray, a British soldier, became aware of the increasing preparations for an offensive. We didn't realize then what was in the offing, but we soon learned because we started making preparations, preparing for a really big affair. In May, they took us from the line, back about 10 kilometers, right away from the fighting. And there, they'd got the whole country flagged out, an exact replica of the German lines with little flags. We started practicing the attack, ready for the big attack, this big attack that was to come. In the meantime, there was a constant procession of guns, guns, guns going up. Instead of the big guns that used to lie right back, miles back, they were bringing them right up, right up into the front. 
Charles Cornell of the Royal Fusiliers also noted the signs of an impending offensive. By this time, we realized that something big was being prepared because we could see the number of guns, new guns, that were arriving on the front, the amount of shells that were coming. There'd been a great shortage before, but now you could see the railways were loaded up with guns, ammunition, wagons and so forth and so on. And we knew something big was coming off. British non-commissioned officer A. Wood found out why such a large volume of guns and ammunition was being moved to the front. We were taken out of the front line and we were taken to an obscure place and we were told by the generals of the battle that was going to be on the 1st of July and we were also told that there wouldn't be a German within miles because the front line would be flattened by the artillery which had been bombarding it. Haig planned an intensive week-long bombardment of the German lines. He hoped that this would enable the infantry to break through and be followed up by a strong cavalry advance. Royal Garrison Artillery Officer Maurice Laws described his role in the bombardment. Well, I was an observation officer for the battery in the forward OP or observation post. I had a couple of signalers with me and the telephone communication with the battery. My job was to observe the fire of the battery on our various targets all day. I started at dawn and went on until dusk. Every evening, a fatigue party arrived with water and food and mail and went away again. We lived there like that and I stayed there until certainly the evening of the 1st of July. Then I went back to the battery. I could hardly read anything because my eyes were so strained from looking through prismatic glasses all that time. And you see, shooting at the trench, you've got to be exact and you've got to be very careful. It went on day after day. There were hours and hours of so much daylight. I wish to God it was midnight. During the opening bombardment, the Royal Artillery fired over 1.6 million shells. The intensity of the attack was unprecedented. It left a vivid impression on all those who witnessed it. British signaler Harry Wheeler recalled the deafening noise the artillery made. The firing was going on for weeks beforehand, on and off, and getting heavier. But the bombardment, when that started, it was what I always called the dance of hell. It was boom, 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 boom. Shells burst all the time, you know guns firing rather all the time. It was a dance of hell, right enough. Those poor boys had to go through it. My god, I shall never get it out of my memory. Yes, a dance of hell. And for Royal Flying Corps pilot Cecil Lewis, the sight of so many guns in action remained clear in his mind long afterwards. When you had to go right over the lines, you see, you were midway between our guns firing and where the shells were falling. And during that period, the intensity of the bombardment was such that it was really like a sort of great broad swathe of dirty looking cotton wool laid over the ground. And so close were the shell bursts, and so continuous, that it wasn't just a puff here and a puff there. It was a continuous band. The whole of the ground beneath the darkening evening was just like a veil of sequins which were flashing and flashing and flashing and each one was a gun. However, even with this overwhelming firepower, the bombardment seemed to be largely ineffectual. A German army officer, Stephen Westman, was on the receiving end of the bombardment and lived through it. He relates as follows. We were under incessant bombardment, day and night. The shells, heavy and the light ones, came upon us. Our dugouts crumbled. They fell upon us and we had to dig ourselves and our comrades out. Sometimes we found them suffocated, sometimes smashed to pulp. Soldiers in the bunkers became hysterical. They wanted to run out and fight the village to keep them in the comparative safety of our deep bunkers. They came into our flimsy shelters to seek refuge from this terrific artillery fire. We had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, but constantly shell after shell burst upon us. 
the British commanders had no way of knowing that the artillery bombardment was ineffective. In their view, no one could have survived such a continuous barrage and still be willing to fight. Thus the attack was going ahead. The time for the attack, or zero hour, was set for 7.30am on the 1st of July. On the eve of the battle, the attacking infantry troops were moved up to the front line. British private Reginald Glenn recalled the feeling as they went forward. We didn't know until the actual day that we were going in. We went in at night and we got so far in and then we were told no smoking. Everybody had got their big overcoats and a haversack with rations in and everybody was helping to carry something as well. And we just went in and relieved the regiments that were in. They came out of one set of trenches, we went down the others because with having all your accoutrements, there wasn't room to pass one another. I suppose we were a bit worried about what was going to happen because the night before we'd been writing letters home. Many of the men had a heartening tot of rum as they waited for zero hour. Some had several, but Donald Murray decided not to have anything to drink. The previous night, at about 12 pm, each dugout had a stone bottle of rum put into the dugout, a gallon bottle, and nearly every man was drunk, blind drunk. I thought to myself, this looks to me like a sacrifice, and I never touched any. I didn't have a single drink. I was determined to keep my head, and it's just as well I did. In the lead up to the infantry assault, a final heavy bombardment was made on the German lines. Royal Garrison Artillery Officer Walter Simons described it. At 5.30 the barrage came down. It consisted of light artillery on the front line coupled with light howitzers. 300 yards beyond that came down the heavier natures. The 6 inch, the 60 pounder, the 8 inch, the 9.2s and the 12 inch and the 15 inch howitzers were allotted special targets and strong points such as fortified villages. Within a few moments, the air vibrated with a concussion. As zero hour approached, the men prepared for battle in crowded frontline trenches. Private R. Mason was among them. We'd reached our attacking positions overnight and we were all ready for the assault an hour before we had to go. And we sat down crouching in the shallow, narrow trench, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was next to the officer and got him something out of his own haversack because he could not turn around to the back. He said very shortly, only five minutes to go. Finally the barrage lifted and the moment came for men like Private Arthur Pearson to go over the top. We were anxious to be over the top and at zero hour 7.30, everybody, we climbed out of the trenches. Two platoons in advance had been and laid on a white tape and they formed the first wave. Every man climbed out of the trenches at the whistle of the officers and not a man hesitated. But I was lucky. I was in a part of the trench where the Barados had been battered down as Jerry, the Germans, sought for a trench mortar. When I ran up the rise out of the trench, I was under the hail of bullets which were whizzing over my head but most of our fellows were killed kneeling on the fire step. Once out of the relative safety of their trenches, the attacking troops had been ordered to advance slowly towards the Germans in long lines. Maurice Symes, like many others, thought this order to be ridiculous. It was just as if we were at that almost was like a training exercise, which was really, I suppose, absolutely mad when you come to think about it. We were just in extended order with everything on your back, your rifle and bayonet, your entrenching tool and everything else. We were just walking, straight towards the German lines in extended order. Well, we were sitting ducks all the way. Our earlier training you see for open warfare, run so far then lie down and then run a bit further. But this was just walking, straight into the death trap, hundreds of us, just hopeless. Officer Alfred Irwin approved an unusual initiative by one of his officers 
to motivate the troops under his command. Well, Captain Neville was commanding B Company, one of our two assaulting companies, and a few days before the Battle of the Somme, he came to me with a suggestion that as he and his men were all equally ignorant of what their conduct would be when they got into action, he thought it might be helpful as he had 400 yards to go and knew that it would be covered by machine gun fire. It would be helpful if he could furnish each platoon with a football and allow them to kick it forward and follow it. And that was the beginning of the idea and I sanctioned that on condition that he and his officers really kept command of their units and didn't allow it to develop into a rush after the ball. If a man came across a football he could kick it forward but he mustn't chase after it and I think myself it did help them enormously, took their minds off it. But they suffered terribly. Neville and his second captain were both killed. As the men crossed no man's land, many, including Private Mason, became separated from their comrades. My officer called across to me and said, You stick to me and I'll stick to you. I said right, but immediately lost sight of him. I didn't know what happened to him, but he was wounded. Very soon I found I was going forward and not many were around me. At this time, a hare ran along in front to my great surprise, with its eyes bulging, or apparently bulging in fear, but I didn't think it was half as frightened as I was. When those who had survived the crossing on no man's land neared the German front lines, it became clear why they were so few in number. The defences were still intact. Arnold Dale of the York and Lancaster Regiment couldn't believe that the deadly barbed wire was untouched. As we moved forward, having got through our own wire quite easily and approached the position we were to take up prior to our own bombardment so that we could move forward into the German trenches, we saw what a terrible job it was, or would be, to get through the German wire. It was so thick. It looked solid black. I can't really say that I could pick out any single strand. It was so solid that in my opinion, a rabbit couldn't have got through it. The men had been told that the initial bombardment would eliminate the German positions, but it had failed to do so. The reason for this was explained by British medic Walter Cook. The Germans were down in 30 foot dugouts whilst the bombardment was on. I have personally been in one and they were so constructed that any bomb thrown down if there was Germans in there, it would only go down so far because it would then go off at a traverse down to the 30 feet. They had selected machine gun posts and they had just mowed down the infantry and we had a big job on. Frank Rain of the Durham Light Infantry remembered how the miscalculation by British planners affected the attack in his sector. We were told that there was going to be this bombardment that would knock hell out of the Germans and all we had to do was get up and walk across. And we only had to walk. On no account had we to stop for anything. Just walk straight through to Berlin. And there wasn't one of us in our battalion that ever got to the German lines. You couldn't. It was absolutely impossible. The jokers, they never learnt. The Germans had these deep dugouts. They were safe as the bank. They were 30 feet down. The Germans opened up continuous and accurate fire on the advancing British infantry, as Stephen Westman remembered. Then the British army went over the top. The very moment we felt that the British artillery fire was directed against the reserve positions, machine gunners, German machine gunners, crawled out of the bunkers. Red-eyed, sunken eyes, dirty, full of blood from the blood of their fallen comrades, and opened up a terrific fire. The British Army had horrible losses. Ernest Bryan commanded the Lewis gun team during the attack. He and his men made it through no man's land, but were met by strong, ferocious German fire. The majority of their wire wasn't cut at all, not by our artillery at all, not even by our trench mortars. So what happened? All that was in there, there was no riflemen but there's machine gunners. When I say the machine gunners, I don't mean the Lewis gunners. Machine gunners who had static machine guns. You could fire 250 rounds on one belt. 
Well, the first thing I did, I put my gun on my shoulder and I sprayed the top. Ah, oh, the German gunner went down. Whether he was hit or not, I didn't know and I didn't care. He was down. They were all down. Around 38,230 British soldiers were wounded on the first day of the battle alone. Maurice Symes, a private in the Somerset Light Infantry, was one of them. Well, we just scrambled over the trench and walked forward. I could see people going down all the way, you know, getting shot. It wasn't a very pleasant feeling. And then I got hit myself. It knocked me out. They said I was more surprised than anything else, really. I wondered what the devil had happened. It felt just like somebody had kicked me in the stomach. A funny sort of feeling, but I knew I couldn't go any further. I just dumped everything except my water bottle and crawled into a shell hole and stayed there for a bit. I had a bullet straight through. Then I got into a shell hole for a bit of shelter and got another shrapnel wound there. With dead and wounded all around and the attack faltering, many British soldiers felt overwhelmed by the situation. Non-commissioned officer Frederick Higgins described what he felt during the attack. I think I got a nasty stomach feeling that I can't describe. Abject fear. You're not paralyzed, actually, but it takes all the stuffing out of you. You just don't know what to do, what to do for the best, whether to get up and go or stop where you are, or what to do. Everybody was in the same boat. I mean, big men and little men all suffered the same. It was a terrific, terrible feeling, really. Due to a British military tradition that officers should lead their men from the front, casualties among officers were high. This led to further confusion for the attacking troops, such as Private Glenn. We were just getting just the same machine gun fire and we really were not knowing we weren't getting any orders at all because of the officers who were shot down and we were just getting this machine gun fire. It was just simply mowing them down. I lay down and there was nobody to give any orders. The British attack failed in many places along the Somme battlefront. Even if men were able to reach the German lines, they were unable to consolidate their position and were soon forced to return to their own trenches. Donald Murray gave a vivid account of the chaos of the fighting. It just seemed to me eventually that I was just one man left. I couldn't see anybody at all. All I could see was men lying dead, men screaming, Men on the barbed wire with their bowels hanging down, shrieking. I thought, what can I do? I was just alone in a hell of fire and smoke and stink. And so I began to creep back towards the line, through shell holes, through the mud and down into the trench, and still there was nobody there. Gradually, we congregated in ones and twos. Although the Germans withstood the majority of the British attacks, in some places the German trenches were reached and objectives were captured. But such gains were only achieved with heavy casualties. British non-commissioned officer D. Cattle remembered the impact this had on his regiment. Well, I crept back on my belly into the trenches about 9 o'clock. Well, it was getting dusk and that was that. I went to a dugout in a trench a lot further back. There were some officers there. They were surprised to see me. They didn't think there was anybody left. I went down into a bunk and I think I slept for 18 hours. The Germans could have walked through if they wanted. There was nobody there. In addition to the nearly 40,000 who were wounded on the 1st of July, around 19,240 British soldiers were killed. These combined losses made it the bloodiest day in history for the British Army. By nightfall, the devastating losses were clearly felt by Alfred Irwin. Well, we were so lamentably few that there was very little you could do that night. But I posted the men as well as I could, and we were not attacked. We were heavily shelled that night, but were not attacked. And so we got away with it. The next day we were relieved. We'd come down from something like 800 to something under 200 in that attack. It seemed to me a dreadful waste of life. 
during the night, Arthur Pearson went out to retrieve casualties from no man's land. The 10% who had been left there called into the line the stretcher bearers, and we were carrying out our wounded all night until it was dawn, and even then we carried on. There was evidently some sort of truce in the dawn because the Germans were carrying out their casualties. Stanley Parker Bird helped the wounded that night as a member of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Some had already been brought in, but the no man's land was littered with casualties. They weren't as thick as peas, I couldn't use an expression like that, but some had themselves been able to crawl back to our trenches. Of course, they were trying to keep cheerful. We had to encourage them. The Battle of the Somme raged until mid-November 1916, but the tragic events of its first day became notorious. News of the losses had a huge impact upon those back home, as well as general public opinion in Britain about the war. Marjorie Llewellyn was a schoolchild in the city of Sheffield when she got news of a relative that had been killed in the battle. Shortly after the 1st of July, the newspaper boys in the streets were shouting the news of the wounded, the killed and the Battle of the Somme. And everybody rushed to buy the papers and were horrified to find that so many of our city battalion were involved in this offensive. The news came through very slowly, but there, sheets and sheets in the paper of dead and wounded, photographs where they could get them of the men and I personally was brought out of the class to be told that my cousin had been killed. Although Royal Engineer Thomas Stewing was in the Somme area on the 1st of July, he didn't take part in the attack, but he realized soon afterwards just how devastating it had been. Frankly, the Battle of the Somme was a ghastly mistake. We didn't realize that at the time, but at the first church parade after that, we had an idea what a shambles it had been. We fell in as usual for the church parade and then the infantry came in, a mere handful. In each battalion, a mere handful of people. And the colonels sat in front of what was left of their battalions, sat there, sobbing. And we were completely taken aback, didn't realize it was anything like that. While the British attempted to restart their offensive, the French component had success south of the Somme. By the 11th of July, General Rawlinson's men captured the first line of German trenches. This forced the Germans to halt their offensive at Verdun in order to reinforce the front along the Somme. For six weeks, fighting became a grinding battle of attrition. On September the 15th, Haig made a final attempt at a battle breakthrough at fleurs corselet Achieving limited success, the battle saw the tank being used as a weapon for the first time. Haig continued to push until the Battle of the Somme's conclusion on the 18th of November. In less than five months of fighting, the British suffered 420,000 casualties, while the French sustained 200,000. The Somme offensive only gained a mere 11 kilometers for the Allies, but importantly, the Germans lost around 500,000 men. In addition, with the opening of fighting at the Somme, the pressure on Verdun began to wane as German troops were moved to the Somme. The German advance at Verdun reached its furthest point on the 12th of July, when German troops reached Fort Surville. However, they were not able to gain further ground than that. Having held, the French commander in Verdun, General Robert Neville, began planning a counter-offensive to push the Germans back from the city. Meanwhile, Falkenhayn's failure to take Verdun as well as setbacks on the Eastern Front led to his dismissal as Chief of Staff. Falkenhayn was replaced in August by General Paul von Hindenburg. On the 24th of October, Nouvelle began attacking the Germans, making heavy use of artillery barrages. Recapturing key forts on the city's outskirts, the French had success on most fronts. By the end of fighting on the 18th of December, the Germans had effectively been driven back to their original lines. The fighting at Verdun cost the French 161,000 dead, 
101,000 missing and 216,000 wounded, while the Germans lost 142,000 killed and 187,000 wounded. While the Allies were able to replace their losses, the Germans increasingly were not able to replace theirs. The Battle of Verdun and the Somme became symbols of sacrifice and determination for the French and British armies. While the war escalated on the Western Front, Hotzendorf moved forward with his Trentino offensive against the Italians. Hotzendorf was angered by Italy's perceived betrayal of its Triple Alliance responsibilities. Hotzendorf opened a punishment offensive by attacking through the mountains of the Trentino on the 15th of May. Striking between Lake Garda and the headwaters of the river Brenta, the Austrians initially overwhelmed the defenders, but the Italians recovered and mounted a heroic defense which halted the offensive at a cost of 147,000 Italian casualties. Despite the losses sustained in the Trentino, the overall Italian commander, Field Marshal Luigi Cordona, pressed forward with plans for renewing attacks in the Isonzo River Valley. Opening the 6th Battle of the Isonzo in August, the Italians captured the town of Gorizia. The 7th, 8th and 9th Battles followed in September, October and November, but gained little ground. Committed to planning offensives in 1916 by the Chantilly Conference, the Russians began preparations for attacking the Germans along the northern part of the front. Due to additional mobilization and the revitalizing of the industry for war, the Russians enjoyed an advantage in both manpower and artillery over the Germans. The first attacks began on the 18th of March in response to French appeals to relieve pressure on Verdun. Striking the Germans on either side of Lake Naroche, the Russians sought to retake the town of Vilna in eastern Poland. Advancing on a narrow front, they made some progress before the Germans began counter-attacking. After 13 days of fighting, the Russians admitted defeat and sustained approximately 100,000 casualties. In the wake of this failure, the Russian Chief of Staff General Mikhail Alexeyev convened a meeting to discuss offensive options. During the conference, the new commander of the Southern Front, General Alexei Brusilov, proposed an attack, the Brusilov Offensive, against the Austrian-Hungarians. With this plan approved, Brusilov carefully planned this operation and moved forward on the 4th of June. Using new tactics, Brusilov's men attacked on a wide front and overwhelmed the Austrian defenders. Seeking to take advantage of Brusilov's success, Alexeyev ordered General Alexei Evert to attack the Germans north of the Pripyat marshes. Hastily prepared, Evert's offensive was easily defeated by the Germans. Pressing on, Brusilov's men enjoyed success through early September and inflicted 600,000 casualties on the Austrian-Hungarians and 350,000 on the Germans. Advancing almost 100 kilometers, the offensive ended due to a lack of reserves and the need to aid Romania. Previously neutral, Romania was enticed to join the Allied cause by a desire to add Transylvania to its territory. Though it had some success during the Second Balkan War, its military was small and it faced enemies on three sides. Declaring war on the 27th of August 1916, Romanian troops advanced into Transylvania. This was met by a counter-offensive by German and Austrian forces, as well as attacks by the Bulgarians to the south. Quickly overwhelmed, the Romanians retreated, losing Bucharest on the 5th of December and were forced back to Moldavia, where they dug in with Russian assistance. The third year of the war closed with no real winner in sight. Now, more so than before, People of the countries involved in the war were starting to question their military and political leaders. The endless casualty reports in newspapers and terrible accounts from the front horrified these countries' populations. The seemingly senseless slaughter of their young men was carrying on unabated with no clear end in sight. They were told by their political masters that the war would be quick. 
that had sent their young men off to war, believing this rhetoric. Many even supported the laws bringing about compulsory conscription for men of fighting age. However, the expectations made by the politicians were starting to sound like outright lies. The military strategies were also starting to be questioned. Some historians have argued that the Battle of the Somme was the beginning of modern all-arms warfare, during which Kitchener's army learned to fight the mass industrial war in which the continental armies had been engaged in since the start of the war. This view sees the British contribution to the battle as part of a coalition war and part of a process which took the strategic initiative from the German army and caused it irreparable damage, leading to its collapse in late 1918. However, Generals Haig and Rawlinson have been criticised ever since 1916 for the human cost of the battle and for failing to achieve their territorial objectives. On the 1st of August 1916, Winston Churchill, then still out of office, criticised the British Army's conduct of the offensive to the British cabinet, claiming that though the battle had forced the Germans to end their offensive at Verdun, attrition was damaging the British armies more than the German armies. Though Churchill was unable to suggest an alternative, the critical view of the British on the Somme has been influential in English language writing ever since. As recently as 2016, British military historian Peter Barton even argued that the Battle of the Somme should be regarded as a German defensive victory. A rival conclusion by some historians such as John Terrain, Gary Sheffield, Christopher Duffy, Roger Chickering, Holger Herwig, and William Fultpot among others, is that there was no strategic alternative for the British in 1916, and that an understandable horror at British losses is insular, given the millions of casualties borne by the French and Russian armies since 1914. This school of thought sets the battle in the context of a general allied offensive in 1916, and notes that the German and French writing on the battle puts it in a continental perspective. However, there exists little German and French writing on this topic, which has been translated, leaving much of the continental perspective and detail of German and French military operations inaccessible to the English-speaking world. Even today, in some British history syllabuses, variations of the question, does Haig deserve to be called the Butcher of the Somme? Or, to what extent can Sir Douglas Haig be considered either a butcher or a hero of the First World War, are used to teach people's historical empathy, evaluation, and argumentative writing skills. This is important, as for so long, the official perspective was that British commanders like Haig were virtually faultless. The phrase, lions led by donkeys, though it predates the First World War, gained traction during the war to describe especially British military commanders who made fatal mistakes, costing the lives of hundreds of thousands of young men. Evelyn, Princess Boucher, an English woman who lived in Berlin during the First World War, recalled in her memoir hearing German General Erich Ludendorff praising the British soldiers for their bravery, and remembered hearing firsthand the following statement from the German General Headquarters. The English generals are wanting in strategy. We should have no chance if they possessed as much science as their officers and men had of courage and bravery. They are lions led by donkeys. Brian Bond, in editing a 1991 collection of essays on First World War history, expressed the collective desire of the authors to move beyond popular stereotypes of the donkeys, while acknowledging that serious leadership mistakes were made and that the authors would do little to rehabilitate the reputations of the senior commanders on the Somme. Hugh Strachan quoted Maurice Genevois as proposing, If it is neither desirable nor good that the professional historian prevail over the veteran, it is also not good that the veteran prevail over the historian. And then he proceeded to take Lydell Hart to task for suppressing the culminating battles of the war thus allowing his portrayal of British generals to assume an easy continuum from incompetence on the Western Front to conservatism in the 1920s. While British leadership at the beginning of the war made costly mistakes, 
By 1915, 1916, the general staff were making great efforts to lessen British casualties through better tactics, which included night attacks, creeping barrages and air power, as well as weapons technologies such as poison gas and later the arrival of the tank. British generals were not the only ones to make mistakes about the nature of modern conflict. We have already seen how the Russian armies also suffered badly during the first years of the war, most notably at the Battle of Tannenberg. To many generals who had fought colonial wars during the second half of the 19th century, where the Napoleonic concepts of discipline and pitched battles were still successful, fighting another highly industrialized power with equal and sometimes superior technology required an extreme change in thinking. The problem was that the commanders were too slow in recognizing the nature of this industrialized warfare and were lax in adapting their strategies accordingly. The mass artillery bombardment employed at the Somme was thought to be more than, a, an effective, more than effective to put the Germans out of action. However, trench warfare was relatively new and the use of artillery was highly inaccurate to achieve specific objectives such as cutting the barbed wire at strong points and taking out machine gun nests. The military planners such as Haig were confident that the mass attack would be successful because such an attack was unprecedented in its strength and nature. But it was this miscalculation that led to the slaughter at the Somme as well as other battles. The strategy of attrition was forced upon the planners through the technology that was ironically developed with the view to end the war as quickly as possible. Instead, attacks such as Verdun and Somme aimed at wearing down the enemy until the enemy ran out of men and willpower. However, the political winds of change were already starting to blow. The Easter Rising in Ireland had jarred British confidence from within its territories. Irish separatists had for centuries tried to gain Irish independence and this had always been suppressed by Great Britain. But the Easter Rising went a long way in changing the opinion of previously moderate Irish by coming to the realization that British intervention in Ireland might not be in the interests of the Irish people. Confidence in the British government had also dropped significantly due to how the war was going. As a result, British Prime Minister H. H. Asquith was forced to resign on the 5th of December 1916. Similarly, civil unrest in Russia was already prominent before the start of the war, but a series of military losses was helping to sow the seeds of a revolution within Russia and would lead to the toppling of a centuries-old monarchy, replaced by a relatively new ideology, communism. Oh 